was I had the privilege in Canada of leading a revival, spearheading and then leading a revival for seven to eight years. And uh, we were enjoying great meetings, incredible services, uh, the manifestations of Holy Spirit. And uh, then one day it just sort of occurred to me, or the Lord stirred up my dissatisfaction, that even though God was visiting our building, the rest of the city really didn't know we existed. Uh, let alone were we fulfilling the great commission of discipling a nation. And I had a real, this was a challenge for me. And uh, how to, you know, my mission then became, if God is showing up at our church, how do we get people to come? So we tried advertisements, we tried different gimmicks and trying to get the world to run to our church. And as good as these meetings were that we were having, they just weren't running to the church. And even when, even when they are, like I experienced the, we experienced in Toronto, the Toronto airport uh, revival, lineups of people down the street, but they were believers who had come from other parts of the world. <laughs> and even John Arnott will tell you the, the city of Toronto really wanted nothing to do with this. And it hardly transformed the city or the country, again, ineffective in fulfilling the Great Commission, if that is our, our commission, if you believe that, which I'm sure we all do. Around the seven or eight year mark, God just pulled the carpet right out from under us and removed his glory from the, from the services. The revival came to a sudden stop. And now as a young pastor, I had no idea what to do anymore. Where do you go from there? Now I really can't get them in the building. Uh, I'm preaching to the same people each week, and I want to fulfill the Great Commission, but I, I don't exactly know how to do this. And uh, the Lord had mercy on me. It was really His mercy that He caused this frustration, because uh, I had to learn how to get the people out there. I began to understand the message uh, of training and equipping the laborers to send them. I knew they had to go out. I knew we had to develop programs and projects. I was seeing that happening here in this church. I knew we had to get people doing that. Now became the problem of how do we train them and send them in a systematic way. So what I did was I took it upon myself to fly here and to live here for a little over a month. And I wanted to study what was happening within this church. Uh, I wanted to dig deep because I knew there had to be more going on here than just great church services. I'm fourth generation PK, fourth generation pastor on both sides. I've been around ministry, I've been to the conferences, and I knew there is something far more profound happening here than just the touch of God alone. And I wanted to know what this missing ingredient is. At that time, when I was coming here, they were calling this church a nation within a nation. And, and to see this church, you had to literally, each of my days here for like 40 days were seven to eight hours of, of interviewing leaders and having to be driven around, around the city. Uh, to investigate how this church was functioning. And in doing so in such an aggressive way, I began to discover that this was a church without walls. Their people were everywhere. Their people are everywhere. And, and influence was happening. And I, I began to ask myself the question, how does one man or how does one church hold this whole movement together? What is the control system that is, that is functioning here? And so I began to dig really deep. And I began to, to discover every time I sat down with one of the leaders of God Embassy, almost always when I asked a question regarding their ministry, they would say these words. We developed a system. <laughs> Literally, almost every time they would say the same thing. I, I would say, well, how does the children's program Run, what do you do with the kids on a Sunday morning? And they would start laughing at me. She actually laughed at me. She said, oh, pastor, we believe children's ministry is more than what we do with children on a Sunday. And I thought, okay, so we pastor the, we believe in pastoring the children of the whole society. And I said, well, how do you do that? Well, we developed a system. <laughs> and and this, this terminology kept coming up. And I thought, what is this system thing? And... Uh, I did my best to understand their structure and system, and I wanted to know because at that time, or before that, Peter Wagner 
major church authority, the late Peter Wagner now, came here. And he actually said, I have been studying and teaching on apostolic churches for the majority of my life in ministry, and I have never actually seen one until today. And I began to understand that there's an element of the apostolic in going beyond the four walls in a, systema in a systematized way that enforces principles, that enforces the kingdom of God in such a way that the spirit and principles of the kingdom become systemic throughout a society and you actually begin to <coughs> occupy territory. I, I don't know if that excites you. That, ex yes. that really excited me because I was tired as, of just church as usual. And, and we still do church as usual, but now we have training, equipping, sending in a systematic way. So when I went home, I began to implement some of the things that, uh, that I had been uh, learning, but still it was vague to me. It was not clear until I came and actually attended a training here a duration of time later and system building was more officially introduced to me just the way uh, it's being introduced to you. I grabbed a hold of this thing like a fire. Uh, when I returned home, now this is a true story, this is no exaggeration, uh, exaggeration. maybe you think this is a bit uh, radical or reeks of obsession, but I, I hired somebody to cook meals for me so I didn't have to spend time cooking, and I sat at the kitchen table for six to seven hours a day for three to four days. Uh, not only did I do the homework assignments again, but I began to obsessively go over this system stuff. Now again, maybe it took me six to seven hours a day because I'm so terrible in math. And algorithms, the concept of algorithms was such a challenge for me. But I began to sit there and set a goal. I'd say I want to reach 10,000 single mothers in our city in one year's time. Okay, 10,000 divided by 360. You know, I would create the algorithm. I would find out I did the math wrong. I would start all over again <laughs> and would create a system for single parents. We never really used that system. We created another one, but I was practicing trying to get the engine going. And, and I didn't realize that by obsessing over this concept, because I knew it was the missing ingredient, or at least it was an, agre an ingredient that would give us effectiveness, uh, I began to kind of train my mind to think in a, in a systematic way. And so I sat there and was working on, you know, building these systems and we developed maybe four or five systems and began to implement them in our church. Now with this new mindset, I began to discover, I began to see how systems are operating uh, everywhere. It's why I mentioned uh, yesterday McDonald's for example. McDonald's is fascinating. I don't know if uh, you were taught any of this in any of the workshops, but I did a study on the history of McDonald's, and McDonald's wasn't always named McDonald's. Mm -hmm. It was actually originally called McDonald's Systems, and it was created by Ray Kroc, who was <laughs> selling milkshake makers, and somebody came and bought a whole bunch of milkshake makers, and he wanted to know why, and he followed this man back and he, he saw how this man was able to make many milkshakes for many people in a fast amount of time. Thus, uh, Ray Kroc and the McDonald's brothers began uh, McDonald's, the fast food chain, over 99 billion served. And this, now armed with this systems thinking, I began to notice this. Like, like really, when you pull up to a, and I'm sorry to use the example of McDonald's, but I think this may, you know, help some people out there who are at the beginning stage of understanding this, you pull up in a, to a drive through you're taking your place in a system. And you pull up to the, there's a menu there, you select what you, what you want to eat, and then you pull up to this box, this, this machine, and a voice, a voice comes out of this box, maybe it's an angel, I don't know. <laughs> and an angelic voice comes out and, and, and asks you what you want to order, and, so you give this, <laughs> you answer back to this box a, uh, what you'd like for your order, and then you move to the next stage in the system. And there's a completely different person that pops out the window, somehow knows exactly what you wanted. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's an angel. You know, maybe it's prophetic. 
And uh, <laughs> she just pops out the window and, and uh, you pull out your card and, and somehow all my money is, is on this, uh, this card. Can you imagine if the people in, in the Bible days were to look ahead and see? They would call it supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. But we know it's all about engineering and yeah. systems. Yeah. We've grown and progressed in that way. It has nothing to do with the supernatural. So you take your, your bank card that has all your money on it, and now they, they, they pop a box out the window, a little black box, and now all you have to do, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you, Now, I'm not, I'm not making fun of anything. I'm not being sacrilegious, and, and I'll get more spiritual for you as we progress here. <laughs> but but just, just touch, and, and there's, a trans, there's a wealth transfer that happens, and the money goes from this account through this machine somehow, and we know not how. And, uh, and then, <laughs> then from, there <laughs> from there, you take your next step in the system, yeah. And there's a completely different person there mm -hmm. who somehow knows what you ordered, what you paid, and they have their, your food for you in under, in under three minutes. Mm -hmm. And the person might even be as young as 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Over 99 billion served mm -hmm. because of their understanding of, of system building. Mm -hmm. uh, so now on a larger scale, uh, when you look at the Roman Empire, and if you do any study with Alexander the Great, for example, Alexander the Great had an understanding of system building. He did things and conquered in a systematic way. Uh, so much so, if you really dig for this one, just for all the, the theologians out there, uh, we have it on good authority to believe that when Holy Spirit wanted to now release the apostolic and take the gospel of the kingdom to the world, uh, Apostle Paul actually retraced the steps of Alexander the Great, setting up what would be uh, apostolic centers uh, in the major hubs that Alexander the Great had conquered. So you see that Holy Spirit was literally tracking with, you know, he, Holy Spirit would forbid them to preach here or to preach there because there was a systematic way and process that God was wanting to establish. The same if you go back to even ancient times and understand the building of the pyramids uh, where they would use complex systems and algorithms based on demonic principles to build things that make us go wow. Systems really are something that uh, the people of God should be using and I think that we don't have to underscore that.